Mark. Sure. There's there's no lesson. Okay. There's no so, just so you show up. In the middle, huh? You just show up okay. and it's on. Okay. And it's I just never had time before. So. Yeah, it's good. Okay. It's it's real good. So now don't say anything incriminating because we're on Facebook and apparently oh, okay. three people are it watching. Starts at what seven? Yeah. Uh, oh, I think oh, so. It's, it's on the website, right? James, what time does Ziklag Men start? Anyone? Anyone? Nathan? <laughs> seven? Seven? I'm almost positive seven. Okay, just show up then. Yeah. No reading, no assignments? No. Okay. Every week you just kind of show up, which is pretty cool. Okay. Keep me on trouble on Monday. But they said it looked like it was more of a heart. Meet here? In my office. In your office? Yeah. They really shouldn't meet in there, not because they shouldn't meet in there, but because well, there's just too many people now. Uh, Facebook world, we will start in a minute. Everybody's still filing in. That's weird. I feel so weird talking like that. It's like I'm talking to my phone, which I've been known to talk to people before. That's what every brother wants, is his sister to teach him how to drive. <laughs> My sister hit the garage twice on the way out. I hope she's watching. She might be. You never know. Hey, Deb Austin. I love it. So, Deb, type me something. Are you still in Orlando? I don't know why I feel like I have to move closer to my phone to talk. So weird. So weird. So strange. So. I get it. You going to play a game with them before you start? This is an edge. <laughs> we just start, tag on it. How about Nate Carr, what he taught us? Don't start your sermons with a joke. The Word of God isn't a joke. That's right. Jesus ain't no joke. <laughs> He always told us that. Gosh, he is so scary. <laughs> See you, Jimmy Sabo. Yeah. Hey, well, actually, I got to say this is Nate, though. So, Nate, hey, this is true. So, Nate Carr. Nobody's looking at you, so okay, come up here and tell him. I'm walking this way as I talk because I don't want you to hurt yourself. So, so, Nate Carr was, you know, three time world champion at, you know, wrestling. So, he was my, so when I was wrestling there, he would ask me, like, after the weekend when I was still kind of, you know, I was still kind of living a bit in the world and living a bit in church, you know what I mean, it's still growing. He would say to me, so what'd you do this weekend? And I'd be like, and I'd be so scared. You're I would on lie Facebook, so like, I would be, I was still, so I still, I mean, it was my accountability time, but it wasn't very good because I would lie. I'd be like, did you go to the bars? No. <laughs> like, 
No, I didn't go to Lawrence Day. I was like, crap, I got <laughs> Yeah, you were scared. Yeah, you were scared. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's fine. Is anybody else outside, Lars? All right, I'll go check outside and then I'll be back. I didn't even hear what he said. Who knows? All right, there's one more car pulling in, so we'll wait, we'll pray, and then we'll get started. <laughs> Trust me, Nate probably knew. He was scary. He was so scary. Nate's like one of the... I mean, I haven't met too many people like this in life. Most people, if they ask you a question, they'll let you off the hook. You know, when you're just in casual conversation. If Nate asked you a question, he'd wait till you answered. And it was horribly uncomfortable. And if you answered wrong, he would tell you you were wrong. It was just awful. It was awful. They, you know, he would never leave. He was just always there. We loved him. But, whew, he'd wear you out. Wear you out. We were in uh, Boise, Idaho at a men's conference. And it was late. It was late for Boise, Idaho. We we're all on Eastern time. And Danny Bugs and I are sitting in the front row together. And Nate's just going. And he preached his sermon once and he was giving her another go. He was preaching the whole thing all over again. And Daniel leans over and he goes, you got to say something to him. I said, I'm not saying anything to him. He said, you got to say something to him. And I said, I'm not saying anything. So he finally finishes. It's like one in the morning. We go back to the hotel, and Daniel was on the floor below us, and he got off the elevator, and he just looked at me, and he went. <laughs> so, so that was the first fast that I'd ever done. So we get to my room, and of course, Nate's not done, so we go to my room, and <laughs> he starts drinking my juice, and that was like all I had. And I'm thinking, okay, you can do this. And I told him, and he just went crazy on me when I told him. He said, how'd it go tonight? I said, well, I thought it was good, but I mean, I think you kind of preached your sermon twice. Shoom! Third sermon. It was just happening. So, it's just Nate. We love him, though. Great mentor. All right. Whoever's outside has 30 seconds to get in here. 30 seconds! They made it. Now everybody's looking. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I said, whoever? There's one more. Uh -oh. oh, tough. I'm starting. <laughs> Poor Karen. <laughs> oh, does she really? Oh, uh, that's funny. Were they in their cars or were they getting out of their cars? Okay, it's happening. We're just going to start praying. All right, let's pray. Father, we love you and we praise you. Thank you. Um, made it through the Gospel of John. Hard to believe, Lord God, just with one chapter a day, one chapter a day, we're already um, almost halfway through the book of Acts. And uh, I look forward to going through this lesson tonight. I look forward to um, just, just learning about the church, Lord God. You know, there's much for us to see here in terms of unity and spirit empowerment. And I just pray, Lord God, that as we go through this lesson tonight, we are absolutely filled by your presence and one. How many times have we read that over the last week, Lord God? Filled with your presence and having, you know, one mind and one heart to be of one accord. It's truly, Lord God, when the word of God is, is preached with power. So I pray, Lord, that we're in that place tonight and that um, we recognize that you're here and with us and filling us and surrounding us. And um, I've prayed this a couple times today, Holy Spirit. Thank you for bringing to remembrance all things here this evening. And thank you for everything that you're going to teach us fresh and new. We love you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So I kind of messed this up. Uh, two of the days... Um, I don't know what I did, but I wrote the devotionals contrary to the questions that I asked. So we'll, 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 we'll go over it. Um, 
and uh, and go there. So, okay. Hey, Lisa. How are you? All right, we're in Acts four. This is this is this huge deal. We read from Acts four thirty one through thirty three. And as they were making supplications, okay, so we're, this is, this is the day of Pentecost. And as they were making supplications, the, the, oh no, it's not the day, day of Pentecost, I'm sorry. Nix that. And as they were making supplications, the place in which they were gathered was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. And both the heart and the soul of the multitude of those who had come to have faith were one. And no one said that any of the possessions belonging to him was his own. But everything was owned among them communally. And the apostles of the Lord Jesus bore witness to the resurrection with great power. And great grace was upon all of them. So that day, the, 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 the question that I asked you to answer was, Why is filling by the Holy Spirit and release of all things worldly the key to speaking the word of God with boldness. Why is filling by the Holy Spirit and release of all things worldly the key to speaking the word of God with boldness? Understand that as you read through the book of Acts, you're going to read of two fillings, okay? One is a one-time deal, and one is something that um, I'll say is is probably in moments, but is probably more ongoing than we realize. The, the one-time deal is when we receive Christ. If you remember back to the, the upper room discourse, Jesus says, it's good that I go away because if I do, the Holy Spirit will, will be sent, will be poured out. And he will be with you and in you. There's the surrounding of the Holy Spirit in this generation. But when we say yes to the reception of the gospel, what is only external becomes internal. Now again, Psalm 139 says that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. God knows us in our inner parts. I'm not quite sure how that all works spiritually. One day we will understand that. But it, it, it's clear what Jesus is saying. At the point of the acceptance of the gospel, when we receive the gospel, when we say yes to the good news of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, there's a literal infilling. <gasps> we breathe in the breath of life, much like Adam is formed up of the dust of the ground, okay? And then God breathes in him the breath of life. What, the Holy Spirit, what is always, you know, who is always external, is now also internal. But what you see also is, and this goes along with what I was saying on Sunday, when we transition from the rhythms of the world into the rhythm that is God, then there's that constant infilling, constant infilling, constant infilling. I just showed a man in my office this example. I said, okay, do you see this coffee cup? He says, yes. I said, look down on the inside of it. He goes, ew. And I said, okay, that's the residual leftover coffee from this morning in that cup, okay? When I get here tomorrow morning, I will take that cup into that bathroom over there. It's the hottest water in the building, okay? The cup's only about this deep. So when I turn that faucet on full, bur uh, you know, full blast, it's, it's so, so shallow, all right, that that hot water will go down in that cup, and the heat and the force of that hot water will break up those impurities, okay? Now watch this because this is very important. As the Holy Spirit comes into us, he drives those impurities out of us. When we're talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit, you're never really empty, okay? Because as that water comes in, it's filling the cup, and as it fills, it's driving out the impurities. Do you, do you, see, do you see the picture? So as it's being filled, your cup is also running over. And the more the Spirit of God comes on into us, the more the impurities are driven out from us. We're always going to work with imperfection, okay? But the purity of God doesn't become more pure. We become more pure on the inside. 
and there's a greater purity of the pouring out because there's less impurities of us. Does that make sense? So you're constantly pouring out, but you're constantly being filled, okay? So when you receive Holy Spirit, you get the fullness of Holy Spirit, but there's this constant infilling, and those impurities are driven out. The, the, you see the picture? Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, so that's, that's what the Spirit of God and the infilling is like. There's an initial, but then it just, it just keeps going, and it keeps going. And as we stay in the rhythms of God, now we're beginning to see the outworking of the Spirit in, in the life. So when you see this, that they are filled with the Holy Spirit, and they have community. The question is, why is filling by the Holy Spirit and release of all things worldly the key to speaking the word of God with boldness? All right. So what do you think after I've said all that? Come on. Roll the dice. Don't be afraid. Just very practically, why do you need the Spirit of God in you to speak the word of God with boldness? It's truth. Motivates. Motivates. Power. power. It's the only power we have. That's the only power we have. That's the only truth there is. That should be the the what, what's the what's the Greek word? Dynamos. That's that's the dynam, dynamite within us. It's the spark. Okay? That's that's who Holy Spirit is for us. Okay? And why in the world would it seem that the release of worldly goods seems to release the power of God even more so. I think it's because then you don't feel like you're of the world, so you can you can be Christ-like. So then you release all that stuff. It doesn't really matter what the world thinks. You're going to stand firmly on how the Holy Spirit leads you instead of being in the world. So when you separate, it's just so much easier. Yeah. Because you don't really care. I mean, I don't, I don't really care what they think, to be honest. Yeah. Just because I'm not of this world. Yeah, you release it. Yeah, I just let go. It's interesting because if I said to you, is there starvation in the world? We'd be foolish if we said no. There's totally starvation in the world. Well, how do you reconcile that with God's children will never beg bread? Got to reconcile that some way, you know? Jesus was never concerned about what he was going to eat. He did not die of starvation. Okay? Jesus was never concerned about what he was going to wear. He died naked on a cross and <laughs> he, he rose in all the glory of God. Understand this. Jesus was homeless, but he was never out without a place to sleep. He, he was never concerned about any of those things. Do, do you see what I'm saying? None of those things, none of those things should be an impediment to the sharing of the gospel, okay? None of those things, even living and dying, should, shouldn't be an impediment to, to the advancement of the gospel. But I might, but what? If you're called, you share. You see what I'm saying? You know? Now, does that mean that, that there's not going to be resistance? My gosh, Yes. There's so much resistance. And, and that's what you're saying, Carla. There is resistance. But the more we lean back into God, the less the resistance affects us anyway. I've been doing this a lot, and Daniel's seen this right here. Just right here. That's where we live. You do not have to leave where you are. You can stay right here. Okay? You don't have to go out and look for ministry. Trust me. It'll come to you. Just stay right here. Just stay right here. I'm not sure we looked for anything any of us were engaged in today. But all three of us said, what a full day. What a full, and we didn't go out and recruit ministry for today. It found us. It found us. And when you're living in God's presence, it'll find you. So don't bring any other baggage along with you. Release it. Just release it. Make sure you're giving, giving, giving giving and then you know a, a, a communion occurs because you're living communally all right just just let all that stuff goes go and seriously if anybody has need of it give it just give it give it give your home 
You know, somebody needs your vehicle, give your vehicle. Somebody needs your clothes, give your clothes. Somebody needs your time, be careful with that. Be careful with that, okay? Be careful with that because your time is valuable, okay? Your time is valuable. Make sure it's what God would have you do. As you read through this, you're going to see that Paul and the crew are ready to go to a certain place. And the Spirit of God says, oh, no, you're not. You are not giving your time to that. You see? Time is the one thing that you have to be cautious about because time's the thing that can get off track with the will of the Father. But clothing, what the heck? Let it go. Food, let it go. How's it? Let it go. All that stuff, let it go. None of that stuff matters. None of that stuff matters. It's just money. <laughs> you know? It's just money. You will not, you will not die of starvation. You will not. You will not die of starvation. That's one of the hardest lessons I've had to learn around here. People will not die of starvation. If they are genuinely interested, they will not die of starvation. Now, that's scary, but I've had to come to realize that. Now, you've got to get out there and you know, help those that are starving. But when God puts somebody in front of you, you can work them through the pain. You can work them through the pain. You can give as you need to give. Restrain as you need to restrain. You know? And, and it'll flow properly. It'll flow properly. I promise you. Okay? All right, let's go to the next one. Acts 5. And having summoned the disciples, <laughs> I love this one, they beat them and commanded them not to speak in the name of Jesus and released them. Thus they departed from before the face of the council, elated because they had been deemed worthy to suffer disgrace on behalf of the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they didn't cease teaching and proclaiming the good tidings of Jesus the anointed. What will it take for the world to stop you from sharing? Let, let me read you what I wrote that day. In the first century, there was no societal acceptance of the gospel message. All right? They didn't have a frame of reference for it. This was all new. We can certainly see prejudice against Christianity today, but during the first century, both political and governmental leaders came out against the gospel with force within months of the ascension, even, uh, uh, and within months of the ascension, even death. That was then, this is now. In America, the best way <laughs> to advance the gospel is to make a personal investment in the community, gain the community's trust, and then watch the community extend access to its people, especially its young people. Modern economies have violent agendas towards Christianity. You hear that? That's very important. Modern economies have violent agendas towards Christianity. You're going to read about that this week. Many denominations have dismissive agendas towards Christianity. Wait a minute, I thought they stood for Christ. Many denominations have dismissive agendas towards Christianity. Yet local school systems and governments who see genuine social justice investment void of proselytizing by compassionate and caring local assemblies will grant access to its population. That is huge. That is huge. I'll read it again. Yet local school systems and governments who see genuine social justice investment void of proselytizing by compassionate and caring local assemblies will grant access to its population. The individuals within those systems will then offer their trust to the family of God. Seems completely contrary to everything we hear, but I'm telling you, kingdom does it every day. And ultimately, those individuals will come to receive Jesus' good news. Christians are not here to change governments or school systems. Economies cannot be saved. That's very important. Christians are not here to change governments or school systems. Economies cannot be saved. 
Personal agenda-driven religious institutionalism cannot be saved. Christians are here to show the face of Christ, share the face of Christ, and welcome individuals into the kingdom of God through their reception of the gospel. Persecution does exist and will increase. But for now in America, the times have changed. How do you feel about that one? <laughs> it is working. It's working here. So Leslie and I go to lunch last Wednesday. And who did we see at lunch, Miss Leslie? That's too long ago. <laughs> Who was sitting at the table beside us? Oh, oh, oh. oh. Okay, now, Dr. Devano. And Dr. Devano said, yeah. and Dr. Devano said to me. You're asking me to re regurgitate? Do you want me to just answer? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> he says, I don't know if you heard if I was retiring, but I am. Would you like to be put on the Mon County School Superintendent Search Committee? Should the craziest evangelical pastor in Morgantown be put on that committee? Yes, I say yes. The answer is yes. Do you know why? Because, thank God, Bill McCullough said, don't go over there and be a jerk. Just make sure they grant you access. Because your presence there is, is what will win hearts. And, and how far have we come? You know, how far have we come? You know, you talk about God adding arrows to the, the quiver of a household. My gosh, it was so easy. And now here we're talking about maybe bringing Sammy on. Here we are, you know, God raises one up and now we're about to get another one <laughs> raised up. And, and now we have before and after school programs. And now we have lunchbox programs. And now we have summer school programs. I mean, and think about this, Tay. I mean, think about how much difference in the community we can make just by showing love to these kids every single day. And, and, and they're, they're not going to stop, you know? There's, a, there's a, a couple of brothers that are part of the after-school program. And Garrett has invested in those two brothers. And honestly, he's not back there with a flannel board teaching them about Jesus walking on the water, okay? <laughs> he's not. But last week, at the end of after-school, Garrett says, y'all want to stay for dinner? And they said, and, and mom said, yes, I think I would like to stay for dinner. So she stays for dinner with the two boys. And Garrett says, you want to stay for worship service? <laughs> yes, we would like to stay for worship service. And then they're in there. And while they're sitting in there and we start taking communion, the youngest of the two brothers, and these kids have a, a long way to go. Like, I mean, more than a marathon. Okay. But. We're, we're working on it. And the, little, the younger of the two says, explain all of that to me. And Garrett gets to explain all of that to him. And then Sunday morning, where were they? At home? No, they were here. And they're in kids' kingdom. And mom's sitting in the front row. And as I'm bringing the pieces of paper over here for, for tonight, here comes mom to check out the kids from after school. Did you enjoy church Sunday? I did. Single mom, husband's dead. I did, I did. And see, that, that's, that's the spreading of the gospel. But everybody wants to go make picket signs and tell the system they're wrong. Tell me something I don't know. I mean, the system is wrong. Go fix the problem. Stop trying to fix systems and go minister to people. Jesus isn't trying to fix Caesar's government or Caiaphas' religion, his institution. He's about people. He was about people. Let's not start making this or continue making this about systems. You know, <laughs> somebody's going, yes, yes. They're all saying yes on Facebook. That's what we need to do. Let's minister to people. Let's minister to people. You know, that's what I love about what you guys do in Mannington. It's, it's not about, psh, psh, psh. it's about John and Susan. Yeah, there was a little girl here after school that uh, 
one, a, a person that goes to church here is, is helping her with a school project. And she said, oh, you're Cameron Kane's dad. And I said, yeah, I am. And I said, uh, what's your religious affiliation? <laughs> she got this look on her face. You know, like, oh my gosh, why would you ask me that? And she said, it was just the sweetest thing. She just said, you know, since my grandparents died, I, I, just, I just have stopped going to church. And I just said, is that because you're angry or you don't have a ride? And she started laughing. And, and it, that's what it was, Mark. It was, I, I, I just don't have a ride. Grandma and Grandpa took me and I don't have anybody to get me out of bed anymore. Because frankly, that's why most teenagers go to church. Because somebody gets them out of bed and says, go to church. But hopefully if we do this thing right, we make an investment in people the proper way. When they don't have a ride anymore, they'll find a ride. You see what I'm saying? So my, my question for that day was, what will it take for the world to stop you from sharing the gospel? How much would the world have to put on you to sh stop sharing the gospel? It's easy to say, nothing. <laughs> Anybody? 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, and I think we create these scenarios out here when we go, oh my gosh, what if this? Okay, well, that, that's my whole point of this, this devotional. We're not there yet. And we keep talking about these things that, I mean... No one stopped any of us from coming here tonight. I mean, think about this. There are now 18 people watching our Bible study over my phone. It's not difficult to get the gospel. I mean, it's not hard at all. It's not hard to get the gospel at all. So let's make it available. And let's stop talking about these hypotheticals and just do it. You know? Let's just, let's just do it. Does that make sense? So, anybody else have a feeling on this? Anyone? 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 Yes. I'll be downright honest about it. I've actually been reprimanded for talking about Bible study. So how do you do that at a place where the policy is no Jesus? You love. You and the people then learn that you're the one to come to if, if they have a prayer. And I think that's the best answer. You love them. You love them. You, you live the gospel every day. They end up at your doorstep. They catch you in the parking lot on the way out of work. Hey, Jan, you know. I mean, hey, Joe, your story with, with Mick still, in my opinion, one of the greatest stories ever. You know, <laughs> he's talking to you about Lord Calvert. And you said, let's just talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> You know, and that's the thing. And, and, and you can't be ashamed of the gospel. I mean, if it's, I mean, would you be a show, ashamed to show pictures of your children? No, goodness, no. Would you be ashamed to show pictures of your grandchildren? As messed up as the, any kid may be. No, my gosh, no, those are your kids. You know what I mean? You're not ashamed. If we're not ashamed of our own children, why would we be ashamed of the creator of the universe? It's all right. Pete, look. People receive Jesus a lot better than what you think they will. It, it will mess them up for a second. Trust me, it will mess them up for a second. But they'll almost thank you that you've shared with them. You know? Be I think we make it harder. Yes. On ourselves and what it means to be. Yeah, we get ourselves all worked up inside, and it, it does. It makes, us hard, it makes it harder than what it actually is. It's not difficult. It's okay, Martha. I do that all the time. <laughs> but the thing is, you're having the conversation. If you have a conversation, look, it's easy to talk about sports and weather. It is. Challenge yourself. Challenge yourself. You know, my dad's partner told me years ago, if you don't have an answer, tell them you'll get the answer. And then bring them the answer. That's a great answer. Like today, this teacher comes to me. And says, well, it was last Thursday, actually, at Connect. She says to me, she says, 
I've got a kid in my class asking me a lot of questions and I don't know how to answer them. I said, I've got this great book at the church. Swing by, I'll give it to you next week. She came by today, picked up the book and she said, this kid is asking me a thousand questions. Answer the questions. Answer the questions. Mom, how did you do it in the public school system? Subversively. <laughs> Subversively. <laughs> I got accused of that. Yeah. I was subversively evangelistic. Yeah. I don't think it was. <laughs> no, I was outwardly evangelistic. <laughs> <laughs> when you taught Christianity from a cultural, religious perspective. I gave them worksheets. <laughs> But you also did it with Hinduism and Buddhism and Islam and things like that. But you might have put a little bit more emphasis on the Christianity side. Worked it in there every time we could. Yeah. We had a Jewish mother call here today and say, my child will be starting at Skyview next year. I understand that you have a before and after school program that I would like to have my child come to. But I know that it's at a, a Christian institution is there someone that I could talk to about that? And, and I think Leslie Brooks did a great job with that. She said, yes. And, and she wasn't passing the buck. She said, yes, I'm going to give this to my pastor and I'm going to have him call you back. And the number's sitting on my desk. And I think the explanation that I'll give this lady will be, will be she'll, I, I bet that child is here next year. And that woman realizes we're not trying to wrangle him in. We're trying to show Christ. Because I'm going to tell you what, when you come face to face with Christ, you're either going to run for the hills or you're going to say, my Lord and my God. You know, I mean, ultimately, isn't that the conversation, which I, without getting into it, isn't that the conversation we had this morning? Absolutely. You want to own up or not? You want to own up or not? And the person that we met with, I, I thought we, we started down a very good road today. You know, that's about as much as we can share about that one. But you present them Christ. Don't be afraid of presenting Christ. He's your Christ. He's your Christ. Tell them Jesus. It's all right. You know, it's all right. Nobody faults you for wearing a cross. You know, they, they're, there's not as much contentiousness over sharing Jesus as we think there is. There will be someday. But not today. Not today. Not today. It still exists. It's still out there. But I've had very few people in my life go, no, 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 I don't want to hear that. I've had very few people. Like, I can't count them on both hands. I could count them on one, but I, I don't think I could count them on two. And more people will be receptive than, than rejecting at this point in Morgantown, West Virginia. Okay? That's all I can answer for. I don't live in New York City. We, we live and minister here. If we go to New York City, we'll see. We live and minister here. So let's live and minister here. Okay? Does that make sense or do you think I'm off base with that? It's okay if you think I'm off base. I don't have a problem with that. Okay, here we go. All right. Acts 6. Here we go. The 12 said, <laughs> It is not acceptable for us to neglect the word of God to serve tables. Within local assemblies... How is the ministry to be properly distributed among pastors and ministers? You all realize you're all ministers in this room. Whether you want to be or not, I know everybody in this room, every person in this room has given his or her heart to the good news of Christ. You, you've welcomed Jesus into your hearts. As soon as you do that, you're a minister, okay? Not all ministers are pastors, all pastors are ministers. So, divvy up the work responsibilities, please. Operate in your giftings. Perfect. Operate in your giftings. How do you discover that? How do you discover your giftings? Uh, I think it's something that probably comes easy to you. It, it's a gift from God. So, I mean, like if mine is sewing, you know, I can do it quickly. Because, I mean, if I have to struggle with something, it's probably not my good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Isn't that funny? That is actually something we need here. What, sewing? Yeah, Lisa says, if my gift is sewing. <laughs> well, the thing is, 
you know, there's a group of ladies here that make quilts for the uh, PICU units. Yeah, at the hospital. God bless Alice Poling. We wouldn't, we would have very few nativity costumes if it weren't for Alice. God bless her. Huh? Yeah, Denise. Yeah, absolutely. They sew them all. And you think about that. I mean, all I can do is sew. Well, about 15,000 people see your gift every year. Now, your name's not on it. It's not like we let you monogram it, you know. But are those stitches enough? Are those stitches enough? If, if you know that you stitched the stitch for God, which, I mean, maybe that's hokey, but if that's your gift, well, by golly, you better do it. What was the thing that um, James said to, uh, to uh, the Young Life guy today? Do you remember what he said about, about um, uh, artisans? Do you remember what he said about that? I'm putting you so on the spot because we, we met for like an hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> Yes, that's it. Yes, okay. That God has always, you know, God had told Kevin uh, many years ago before this all really took off and started that he would send the artisans. So if there was ever a need or a ministry that needed to come about, that he would send the person with the gifts to be able to start that ministry. You know, and as, I don't know, as we were talking today, like I said, I just, I see it evolving more and more that people are now being sent into ministry and saying, oh, I have this gifting. Maybe maybe this is something I can do. Maybe this is an impact I can have for the big kingdom. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a beautiful thing to see people discover their gifts and that God has sent them to West, over West, West Virginia at this point in time mm -hmm. to do what God has called them to do for the kingdom. Somewhere between July of 1998 and the first weekend in December of 1998, I was praying, and that's what God told me, okay? Bezalel and Aholiab. Bezalel and Aholiab. Book of Exodus. God tells Moses, I need you to build all of this. And Moses writes it all down, and he goes, I, I don't know how to weave tapestries. <laughs> I'm not a sculptor. I'm not a stonemason. I'm none of these things. I don't know how in the world you're going to expect me to do all this. And God says, I'm going to send you Bezalel and Aholiab. I'm going to send you every single artisan you need. And that's what I was praying. I was saying, Lord, you're asking me to start a church. <laughs> I have no clue how this thing's going to get pulled off. I have no clue. And he said, don't worry. I'll send you the artisans. And they started showing up. They just started showing up. And it was, boy, I'm going to tell you what, it was a ragtag bunch for a while. But we got her done. I mean, we did. We did. We got her done, you know. I'm, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, Tay, but you think about all the training, all the schooling, you know, being a professor at the university, so on and so forth. You can clearly see how God is, I mean, just absolutely crafting your life right now to shape kids to the nth degree in this community. I mean, can't you? Yeah, it's pretty powerful. It's just pretty powerful. I cannot wait till you all see what Tay does. You're probably sitting here going, we, we barely know Tay. You wait to see what she does with these kids. It's, it's going to be ridiculous. I mean, it's just going to be ridiculous what she does with these kids. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be absolutely amazing. So I think when we talk about finding your gift, you have to find time. It's like I said Sunday. You have to find time to spend with God. And then here is a, here is a good prayer. God Will you show me what it is you'd want me to do? I'm, if you think God won't answer that prayer, you are crazy. That is a prayer God always answers. It's a scary prayer, too. <laughs> yeah, it's a scary <laughs> prayer, too. It absolutely is. Yeah. I mean, hey, yeah, don't, don't be praying that unless you want a job. <laughs> but it's true. I mean, if you really want to serve the Lord, and look, look here, if you're a Christian, you need to serve the Lord. No, nobody gets to sit. Every, everybody has to take up, take up a work. Okay? Whatever it is. So that is a prayer that every Christian should pray. What is it you would have me to do? 
To whom would you have me minister? Now think about something. And I've used this example a thousand times. Jesus is hanging on the cross and he gives somebody a job to do. What's the job? Huh? Take care of my mother. That's exactly right, Ed. He looks at John and he says, it's my responsibility as oldest son to care for my widowed mother. I'm dying now. I will resurrect and ascend. Someone needs to take care of mom. And that's John's responsibility. John takes care of Jesus' mother. Now that seem, may, may seem like the most worthless job in the world. That's a pretty good job. Every job is equal. Go ahead, Mom. Oh, yes. You want to tell that story? Clown of God? No, no, you tell the story loud and proud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a role for every person. There is a role for every person. You know, and that's why I think that that work that Garrett's doing right now is so important. You know, Garrett's not standing up here teaching lessons. He's not doing a lot of that stuff. But like there was a kid that got bullied on the bus today. Kid that got, sorry. That always upsets me. No kid should be bullied, you know. No kid should be bullied. And Garrett was just sitting over here today with him, just sitting with him. And he kind of rallied the kids around him. You know what I mean? Just rallied the kids around him. That, that, that's, that's a job. I mean, that's a job. Not everybody has to preach. I mean, Dan, look, I, t- I, t- I told that guy today that we were meeting with, I said, if, if you're looking for somebody else to preach around here, you can probably find it sitting in this booth right here. It's going to be one of the two of us, you know? But I said, okay, fine, that job's taken. What's your job? What's your job? You know? Now, the other side of that is, and this is where the church has to help us. Now that you've been here, okay, and now that your responsibility has increased, tell the room and the people listening, what is the level of importance of what, what is said here? Okay, it's not acceptable for us to neglect neglect the word of God to serve tables. We must give ourselves to the scriptures and prayer. Why is that so important to us? Because we're the ones up there preaching and teaching. Well, I mean, I think it's what you and I were talking about before we came in here. I mean, mm-hmm. there will there will always be something to do. Yeah, I mean, there just will. There's always something calling. Our names, and that's for everyone in here. But God is that, like you know, what we prayed Sunday at nine o'clock service. Is God is that still small voice that it, that I mean, we have to stow away time. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I think about what you were saying with the the, the, the coffee cup. If you don't ever allow the water to go into the cup, mm-hmm. how can you ever expect anything to come out of the cup? Yes, you know, and it's such a huge deal. That, you know, we here at Kingdom start our day with with prayer. You know, you start your day with time away with God. I mean, it's it's hard to pour anything out when there's nothing being poured in. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, you, you run on fumes to get stuff done and thank, you know, thank God that we have a gracious God that will tolerate that for some time. But what he desires is time with you. Mm-hmm. you know, time alone with you. And, and you know. I think that's so huge that that's, that is what drives our relationship with others is our relationship with God. You know? I know what I'm going to ask is a little bit of a silly question. How easy is it to write one sermon? How easy, I don't even have to finish the question because he knows what the question is going to be. How is it, how easy is it to write three in a row? <laughs> Let me tell you something. Anybody can preach one. Well, most people can preach one, but when you got to, when you got to do it three weeks in a row and then you get a week off and then you got to do three more weeks and then you get a week off and then you got to go three more weeks. It's, it's not just coming up with an idea, is it? It's more than that. You truly 
have to hear the voice of God. You better rely on it. You had better rely on it. Go ahead, Ed. What are you going to say? Yeah, that's it. You had better. You, you talk about my sheep know my voice. Because I'm going to tell you what. Early on in preaching ministry, when you're learning, and he's way past that point. <laughs> it gets quiet sometimes. <laughs> That doesn't count two funerals. Oh, no, right. 20 counseling sessions. It doesn't all the teaching. And, and I'm not saying that, you know, well, you know, those things are all going on. But if you don't rely on God, man, that's, that's tough. Hmm. That's tough. <laughs> those of you that can't hear, we realize that I'm trying to remedy that problem. But I'm a novice at Facebook. We'll do the best we can in future weeks. <laughs> Leslie, what do I do every Sunday afternoon? Take a nap. For? Two to three plus hours. Amen. Depends. It's exhausting. Amen. You are destroyed by the time service is over. I mean, come Easter Sunday, I, I was not functioning when it came. I slept till after six o'clock. I slept for four hours on Easter Sunday. Because you're just, you're exhausted. You are exhausted. There is no tired like preaching tired. Can I get an amen from right there in the front row? <laughs> There's no tired like preaching tired. So, okay. I think it's just confusing. Don't read Joel. You don't read Joel. Daniel doesn't read Joel. Joel. You know, you're going to miss God and you're going to get burned out and you're going to walk away from the ministry. And how many people walk away from the ministry because of burnout, which is what you're saying. Tons of people. Tons of people. And that's why the two of you and Jenny have, you have to enforce that. You have to enforce it. Tim, he has to enforce it. You, you guys as a team, you have to enforce that because it is, it's just, I can't even imagine I'm never going to be able to do that. I can't even imagine. I know when you manage people, people are needy and you're going here, you're going there and you're seeing the 15 million different directions and sometimes you that's what I was saying about the time. Yeah, you know, and that's the thing. We have to say no. We have to spend time with God. It, it is so important. I explained it to Daniel, in my opinion, like this the other day. I think I used this as the example. <laughs> it's a silly example. <laughs> it's almost like a... a a tag team studio wrestling match, you, you know, and that's what we do here. Daniel and I make a very, very good tag team because the intensity level here is so high. Every once in a while, you got to tag out. You got to tag out to your partner and that's what we're doing here. You know, I go for a little while and then I tag out and then he goes for a little while and then he tags out and, and it's become effective and people are really growing. Through, through all of this. And, and you, just, you just can't get to everybody. It's impossible. And so that frustration, and I can't imagine because you're dealing with thousands of people in the Acts 2 church, okay? You're dealing with thousands. We're over a thousand now. I mean, we had almost 1,600 here on Easter Sunday, had 800 here on Sunday morning. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot, but you, you press on and, 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 and you do it, you do it. But that's why that time is so important. It's just so important. So, yes, Ed, close us out on this one. <laughs> I think that's part of the, we talked about being refilled and refilled and refilled with the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. But I think that what's needed in this passage that we're talking about for me is that the 12, that's what they were called to do, was preach the word. Mm -hmm. They can't do everything. They can't. Right. And, and they chose seven, but those seven had to be filled with the Holy Spirit also. Not just to preach, but to do that ministry, which is feeding and distributing the food and so forth. And I think it's awesome that I believe that because they were filled with the Holy Spirit, doesn't say anywhere in there where any of them complained. No. Or said, I'm above this job. I should be like him. Maybe I should go preach. None of them said that. I think that's part of being filled with the Holy Spirit also, is the humility that comes with it and, and the, the heart of the servant. So true. 
So to kind of restate for those that are watching, what, what you're saying is 100% correct. All of the fights about who's the highest, all that stuff goes away. And all after Pentecost, ain't nobody jockeying for position no more. Everybody does his or her job and does it well. And it just keeps saying, and the Lord added to their numbers daily. That is a fantastic point. Go ahead. Oh. The Holy Spirit signs and wonders followed him. I mean, miracles were happening at his hands, but he was distributing food. And, and, you know, I mean, God will use anyone who's willing, and it doesn't matter where you're at as long as you're doing what God wants you to do, or you're searching for God wants you to do. And the Holy Spirit will be humble for what you do. You, and God's going to work through you. You are 100% correct. Stephen didn't get a lesser job. You're right. right. I mean, when, when, when he's caring for the, the, you know, the Hellenistic widows, I mean, he's, he's sharing the Spirit of God with them. And that's why it's so important. I haven't delivered a lunchbox to Skyview Elementary. By the end of this year, it'll be two school years. I haven't delivered a one. And I don't need to. It's okay. It is okay. It's all right. Soon you won't be doing that either. You won't. You just won't be able to. Now, here's the weird part. We still have an obligation to carry out Matthew 25. Food, drink, shelter, clothing, visitation, visitation. Okay, we still have that obligation. And we can't say, well, that's everybody else's job. It's still our job, okay? But within that, where, where that is maybe primary for others, it's secondary for us, though it's still super duper important and we still need to do it. So, okay, we've got about 10 minutes. All right, let's go to Acts 7. Oh, gosh. This is where I went off the rails a little bit with the questions. Sorry about that. Let's, let's stick with the devotional just because that, that's what everybody got. This is something that I've really been thinking about, probably more than I should be thinking about it lately. But it, it's, it's, it's something that's becoming very close to my heart. Acts 7. But being full of the Holy Spirit, gazing into the sky... Stephen saw God's glory and Jesus standing at God's right hand. Here's what I wrote. To be absent from the body and present with the Lord is not nearly as far away as one may think. Abraham had dinner with the second person of the, tr second person of the Trinity and two angels. Moses and the 70 elders of Israel had dinner with God. And Moses was able to look upon God as a friend looks at a friend. Joshua saw the second person of the Trinity prior to the Battle of Jericho. Samson's parents saw the second person of the Trinity. Elisha asked God to open the eyes of his servant so the servant could see both the physical and the spiritual world. Isaiah saw the Lord in the temple. Zacharias, Mary, and Joseph spoke to angels. Simon Peter was released from prison by an angel. You'll read about that this week. It's a great story. Paul saw the heavenlies. While exiled to Patmos, John had a conversation with the ascended Jesus. Stephen, seeing Jesus, is not so shocking. There is a world amidst the world. This world is far broader than we presently see. And it is possible to see even more. To see more should never be pursued as a sign. That is very important. To see more should never be pursued as a sign. I should probably read that three times. To see more should never be pursued as a sign. Seeing more is a reality. And that reality is controlled by God alone. So live holy and look. There's far more to see. That's what I wrote for that day. The question that I put on your lesson was, what does it mean that Jesus stands for us all? I don't know why I wrote that devotional contrary to the question that I asked, but I think the devotional is probably more right than the question. When you hear me read that devotional, what goes through your head? What are you thinking? What do you think the point is I'm trying to make with that? Why would I tell you all about all those divine encounters?
It's like talking to Garrett. I said to him the other day, what are we going to do? Have a staring contest now? I asked you a question. <laughs> when you hear me read about those things, initially, what's your, what's your first thought? Come on. Did I have a visit in King Jesus? Praise the Lord. You're not alone. There's that possibility. There is the possibility. We don't seek it. We live holy, but we don't close our eyes either. We don't close our eyes. We pay attention to the world around us. Who else? Our faith is not based on sightings. Our faith is based on the word of God. That's what our faith is based upon. Okay? But these are not stories. This is reality all around us at all times. You know, it's, it's, it's easy to sing a song like we are standing on holy ground and I know that there are angels all around. Are there? <laughs> you know, when we pray God's protection over Westwood, as we've prayed since all those suicides happened with those kids, what are we praying? What are we praying? You know, there are two wonderful books that I'll encourage you all to read. Both by Frank Peretti, This Present Darkness, Frank Peretti, P-E-R-E-T-T-I, Frank Peretti. They're older books. I'd say late 80s, early 90s. This Present Darkness and Piercing the Darkness. Excellent books. I'll call them fictional, though I learned a lot about the spirit world when I was reading. There's a lot going on around us. There's a lot going on around us at all times. And this is what I'm saying. Don't get caught up in all the hype of all that silliness. Because people will draw you into the hype. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the foolishness that comes along. Oh, I saw. Okay. Let, let me give you an example. So let me tell you why Jason Upton became famous in the world. And this is, I realize what I'm saying is stupid. Okay? I realize what I'm saying is stupid. Because it's not true. It's not why I became famous. And I learned it real quick. He sings this song called Fly. And after he sung the song, okay, he comes down. It was a live worship service. He comes down off the platform. And this little child walks up to him and says, Mr. Upton, Mr. Upton, that was really neat that that angel was behind you up there. Oh, thank you, little boy. You know, went on his way. Well, when they went back to the studio to, to cut the the CD down, there was more than three voices up there. There was an extra voice and no one was singing among them. And they realized that what the little boy saw was, was real. So when I meet Jason the first time and he comes here, I asked him, because everybody asks him about that song if you're familiar with his music. I said, so tell me about your song Fly. And Jason and all of his Jasonness said, it's not a song. And I said, what? It's on your CD. He goes, it's not a song. It happened once. And it's over. And I don't sing that song. And I really appreciated that. It's not trying to profit on one night. You know what I mean? That's pretty special. It was for that moment at that time. And I'm not going to get rich off of this. I thought that was very important. Very important. And you learn a lot. What happens in the moment happens in the moment. You leave it be. You leave it be. Because trust me, you, you'll never be short of finding people to run after wildfire. That's what Jesus says. When they say, I'm over here, don't go. <laughs> don't go. You stay right where you're at. You stay right where you're at. And it's amazing. If you'll just look at what's in front of you. There's some amazing thing happening. And we don't have to look for a big angel in the room, you know, or Jesus showing up. Yeah, people have seen the Lord. I mean, my dad's sister saw Christ sitting on the end of her bed, you know, saw Christ sitting on the end of her bed. I've had my experiences. You all have had yours. But our faith isn't based on a moment. Our faith is based on the Living God. That's what our faith is based on. It breaks my heart when people think that people are gone. 
Gone where? Gone, I mean, with God. The Lord is actively involved in all of our lives. We should never think that he's distant. Should never think that he doesn't love us or doesn't care or isn't listening. I'm learning that that beautiful silence is a great thing. I'll I'll close this with this. When I read you that poem on Sunday morning, you know, um, Dark Night of the Soul, when I originally came across it, I thought, oh, this is scary. This is something bad. It's not scary. It's not bad. God wants us to look for him. He wants, look, he, he's, he, you're never going to have to cry out Ollie Ollie Oxen free on God. You'll never have to cry that out. Ever. Ever, ever, ever. You'll never have to say, okay, Lord, I give up. Come out from your hiding place. It, you, you may walk away from his hiding place, but you will never have to call him from it. If you seek him, you'll find him. You will find him. And I think that's part of the beauty of the whole search. Just hang in there. You know, you'll read that this week when when Paul is in Athens. He's not very far away from us. He is not very, you will grope and you will strain and you will stretch, but he is not very far away. Even in the darkness, he is there. (laughs) Even in the darkness, he is there. Okay, that all makes sense? All right, much, much to do this coming week. This is going to probably be this week and next. This will be your last week in the book of Acts. Um, Those of you online, uh, all 22 of you, you can go to earlywillirise.com and get the daily devotionals. That basically follows our discussion. We're trying to figure out a way to post the the questions. Everybody gets them here. If you want to email me, um, you can email me. My email's on the church website. Just email me and I'll, I'll be happy to email them to you. And, you know, we have one person in the room that likes to send me poems. Um, and they're really catchy. So if you'd like to send me a poem, you can send me a poem too. Mike Glosser. <laughs> so, all right. Well, let me pray with you here. And we'll get, we'll get you out the door. Well, God, what a great night it's been. And, you know, we're trying to figure this whole thing out with Bible study and this Facebook and getting people to be able to hear and, You know, I look back over our conversation tonight and just say, it it is amazing, God, how we're able to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. And and Lord, I'm not saying there's not persecution. I'm not saying there's not people dying for the faith. There are. And we need to absolutely be fervent in prayer about those things. For whatever reason, Lord God, you've put us in Morgantown, West Virginia, and Westover, West Virginia, or whatever community in this county in which we live, and, and you've called us to just keep bringing the gospel. And that's what we need to do. And God, we may run across, um, you know, uh, something which we may deem miraculous, but that's not why we're doing what we're doing. We're doing it because people need to know the good news of Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, that every single day that we live, we will give ourselves to the advancement of the good news. God, make that so. I know you want to. And, and, and I know that's your desire, but we are here and we are surrendered to you. Um, give us the grace to do this every single day. I know that's a prayer you'll answer. Give us the wisdom to do this every single day. Show us, Lord God, where you've gifted us and just absolutely flourish the giftings so that we can do this every single day. I know there are a lot of uh, prayer requests represented in this room. And I pray, Lord God, this is, this is a pure prayer, that you will meet our needs according to the riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That's what your word says. Meet the needs according to the riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you so much for where you have us, what you're teaching us. We don't take it for granted. We love you so very much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. God bless.